Hi, everyone. Welcome to Every Day, your daily stop for virtual reality content. I am D, and today I'm going to be talking about time warping. Time warping is a new feature of the Oculus SDK version 0.3.1, which was recently released. And this is a pretty big release of the SDK. Lots of exciting new features, of which this is one. This is a preliminary version of time warping, but it's already quite effective. Uh, time warping has two main purposes. One of them is to decrease latency. In other words, the time between when you move your head and when you see the view get updated. This is really important for you to feel immersed and present in VR. The other thing that it does is it can improve your frame rate. And again, VR requires you to have a pretty high frame rate. For example, DK2 requires you to keep 75 frames a second at all times. And so being able to increase your frame rate is pretty important for VR. We're going to talk about how it does both these things. First of all, it was designed by John Carmack. He was actually blogging about this uh, before he joined Oculus. You can see a link to his original blog post in the description about it. And it was uh, most likely also implemented by him in the Oculus SDK. Um, but the post-rendering warping techniques that he's using um, date all the way back to research that was done in 1995. And even back then, they were thinking about using it in virtual reality. It just wasn't quite time for them yet. And part of the reason for this is that time warping uh, works best over very short intervals, or rather very short um, distances. And I'll, I'll talk more about that, why that's the case in a minute. But basically, the, the upshot of this is that it works better today than it did back then, because we're not asking it to do as much as we used to. And this is a very similar story to the story with, say, prediction, which doesn't work very well over long periods of time, but works well over short periods of time. Let's start with this simple Tuscany scene. So I'm looking at the staircase, looking over at the fireplace. It's only a few seconds long, but at 60 frames a second, that's quite a lot of frames. Now, if we want to keep up 60 frames a second, that means we're rendering each frame on average uh, in 16.7 milliseconds. For simplicity, let's assume each frame's taking at most 16.7 milliseconds to render. So at the beginning of the rendering of a frame, which usually starts right after the previous frame has been displayed on the screen, we grab the current position of the user's head from the Rift hardware. We set up our virtual cameras in a matching position. We render the scene. Then we take that scene and we send it back to the hardware to be displayed. Now, uh, because the refresh only happens once every 16.7 milliseconds, if we finish our, finish our image early, the user still doesn't get to see it until it's time for the refresh. So. The real motion to photons latency of this interaction is between the time when we read the head position from the rift and when the image is displayed on the rift. And in this rendering scheme, that can be as long as 16.7 milliseconds. And that's pretty bad. So the question is, how can we do better? There are a couple approaches to try and do better. One of them is we can just start rendering later in this 16.7 millisecond interval. So we could start, say, 5 milliseconds in. If we can still manage to finish our rendering and send the frame onto the device uh, by the end of that interval, then it'll still get displayed on the screen, and our data will be 5 milliseconds newer than it otherwise would have been, and we'll have 5 milliseconds less latency. The problem with this is that we are playing a game of chicken here, because if we go into a scene where suddenly the complexity of the scene is increased, that's going to increase our render time. And if our render time increases enough, we'll actually no longer be able to finish rendering the scene before it's time for the refresh. As a result, we're going to drop a frame. The user's probably going to see the same frame they saw previously, and it's going to be a really, really bad experience. So an alternative is to start rendering at the beginning of the interval, just like we were before, and once we've finished rendering the frame, we wait until it's almost time for the refresh. And then, at the last possible minute, we grab the user's latest position from the hardware. Then, we take advantage of the fact that the user probably hasn't moved their head very far in 16 milliseconds, which means the new view is going to look very similar to the old view. In other words, if we can find a way to quickly transform that image that we're all done rendering so that it appears from the correct view that the user's head is at right now, 
by just making small changes to the image. Then we can send that new updated image to the headset and it will display it and it'll be very, very recent with very low latency because we just got the information to transform that image only a few milliseconds before the end of the frame. Moreover, because this procedure that updates the image is based on the number of pixels in the image and not on the complexity of the scene, the amount of time that it takes is always going to be highly predictable. And that's important because that means there's no risk of missing our deadline. We always know how long it's going to take and we can schedule it so that it's always going to complete before the end of the frame. This procedure that updates the image to show it from a new location nearby is time warping. Now we know how time warping can decrease latency, but earlier I mentioned you can also use it to increase your frame rate. So how does that work? Suppose that you're only able to get 50 frames a second out of your game engine instead of 60. That means you're taking 20 milliseconds to render every frame. Now we want to increase our frame rate to 60 to match the refresh rate of the LCD in the development kit 1. To do that, every time that it's almost time for a refresh, we grab the latest frame that has already been completely rendered. Not the one that's rendering right now, but the last one that finished. We get the current headset position from the hardware. We remember the headset position that that previous frame was rendered from, and then we just update that frame by using time warping. The updated frame will be rendered from the current, up-to-date correct position, and we can push it immediately to the hardware while we're still working on the next frame. Now in principle, this scheme could be used to increase your frame rate from anything, even one frame a second, all the way up to 60 frames a second. However, there are problems with that, and I'm going to describe them when I talk about how time warping works. But the gist of it is, you want to make sure that you're time warping over the shortest distance and the shortest period of time that you can. Otherwise, you're going to have problems. Next, we're going to talk about how time warping actually works. First, we're going to talk about depth maps. Whenever a computer renders a scene, it simultaneously creates a buffer in the background that tells it exactly how far away from the camera or the camera plane every pixel in the image is. The reason it does this is because it needs to know whenever it renders a new object whether that object is in front of or behind the objects that it's already rendered on the screen, and this is a simple way to do it. This buffer is called a depth buffer, or a Z buffer, or Z depth buffer. And because the system is already rendering it, we get it for free, no extra cost, and we're going to use it to help us with our time warping. I'll get to that in a minute. First, let's talk about a simple scene that we want to perform time warping on. So here, we have two squares, flat squares, floating above a plane. The one on the left is farther away from the camera, and slightly larger. The one on the right is closer to the camera and slightly smaller. They look about the same size from the camera's perspective. And we're going to move the camera a bit to the right. Now if we move the camera to the right and then we render the new scene, this is what it looks like. What we'd like to do is reproduce this view without having to render a new scene from scratch using just the first image and the fact that we're moving the camera by a known amount. Now, how are we going to do this? The idea is that if we take this image together with its depth buffer, that means that for every pixel, we know its exact location in space. We can think of each pixel as being a tiny square in space, just like these squares we're looking at, but much smaller. And those pixels have a specific position, an x, y, and z coordinate, which we can determine from their position in the image along with their depth buffer value. Once we've determined the position of the pixel in space, we can shift it left by the same amount that we shifted the camera to the right. Then, we project it back onto the image plane, and that's its position in the new rendered image. When we do this for every pixel, we get a resulting image that looks like this. Now this image is actually pretty good, 
the two squares are in exactly the right position in the image, the lighting and shadows on the squares and the plane below are exactly as in the correct image because these are diffuse surfaces and the change in the angle did not change their lighting or their shadows at all. The main difference is that we've got these black regions. Where did those come from? If we look at the first image again, we'll notice that these two squares are covering up part of the plane behind them. We don't actually know what that part of the plane looks like. For all we know, there could be a family of elves living under that plane, and we wouldn't be able to see them. The technical term for this is occlusion, which is just a fancy word meaning you can't see something because there's something else in front of it. When we change our viewpoint, it results in disocclusion, which is a fancy word meaning we can now see behind something that we couldn't see behind before because we moved. To show you another example of occlusion and the kind of artifacts it can create, here is a rendering of a teapot sitting on a plane. And based just on this one image, we are going to rotate the camera around the teapot and see what happens. As you can see, the teapot doesn't have any back. Because we can't see the back from our initial position, it doesn't exist. In addition, the camera is casting a shadow of nothingness behind the teapot, a region of the plane that we can't see from our initial position, and so, again, it doesn't exist. In order to deal with this occlusion problem, there are two main approaches. One of them is we can guess what the disoccluded regions are supposed to look like and fill them in. To do this, we can use inpainting algorithms. If you've used Adobe Photoshop CS5, it has a feature called Content Aware Fill in which you can select regions like these and tell it to fill them in in a natural way so that they continue the patterns of the surrounding area. Now, these algorithms can be relatively expensive and they can also produce unpredictable results in some situations. They work best when the regions are small, but they definitely have their problems for this application. So a different approach that we can take is we can constrain how the camera moves in order to eliminate this effect. Basically, as long as the camera is not translating from side to side, up and down, or forward and back, if it's only rotating the viewpoint, there will be no occlusion artifacts because we can only see from that fixed position the same points in space that we could before. We're just looking at a different angle. Here's our teapot again. And if we simulate just rotating our eye left and right, you'll notice that no artifacts appear. Now, it's not very obvious that we're rotating our view when we're just looking at the teapot. But if I look at this other example that I came up with, which is a full room, then we look left and right inside this room, and it's very clear that we are turning our head left and right, and that nearer objects are moving across the view faster as we turn, as you would expect. But we're not having any occlusion artifacts. Now, there is a problem with this approach, which is when you turn your head normally, you do not simply rotate your viewpoint. That would be like rotating your body around your eyeball. That's not what you do. You turn your head, you rotate your eyes around the middle of your neck. And when you do that, that causes not only rotation, but a change in position of your eyes as well. It's a small change, but it's a big enough change that it allows you to perceive a certain amount of parallax as you turn your head. And that's how, part of how you perceive depth in the real world. If we look at the same scene when we're rotating for around the middle of our neck, we'll see that the occlusion artifacts are back. And although they're pretty minor, they're definitely present. Finally, last but not least, let's check out time warping in the Oculus SDK. So this application that I'm in right now is Oculus World Demo. Oculus World Demo is a simplified version of Tuscany built in C++ uh, right on top of the Oculus SDK. And as you can see here, we've got our familiar house with all the objects in it, our staircase, our chairs in front of the fireplace, 
There's no fire in the fireplace, no animations in this version. And there is, um, I'm, I'm running 60 frames a second, so I can't really show you how it improves frame rate. But what I can show you is if I press the C key, the C key stops the engine from rendering any more frames, and I'm just stuck with whatever frame it last rendered. Now, if I continue to look around, I can still look around because time warping is producing new frames for me. Now, if I look very far, I will very quickly encounter the edge of the screen, and I'll see some black in the edge of my vision. But normally, you wouldn't be using this to warp quite this far, and so it wouldn't be very obvious at all. Another thing you can do is just try and um, increase the, uh, the uh, render target size so that you have a little bit of extra room on the side for time warping to use. Now, like I said before, this is not exactly the same thing you see when you look around normally in the game. And this isn't obvious at first, but I found a way to show you. So check out this chair. I'm looking at this chair. And if you look very carefully, there is a triangle of light that I can see around the chair that's coming through the window. So you can see it's just the edge of that triangle. If I turn my head to the right, the triangle of light gets larger. If I turn my head to the left, it gets smaller. This is because of the neck model used in the development kit one, in which my eyes are actually pivoting around the base of the center of my neck, like that. However, if we look at the chair and then we hit C, and then we turn our head to the right, you will see that the triangle of light is remaining exactly the same size, no matter how I turn my head. This means that both of my eyes are only having their viewpoint rotated, and they are not adjusting their position in space. This allows the current version of the Oculus SDK to avoid the occlusion problem, but it does result in some inaccuracy in the position of the virtual cameras. You can pretty much get away with this as long as you're using it only on very short time scales. That's all for today. I hope you learned something about time warping. And everybody have a great every day.